Jaka Jaka Jan Jan Jaka Jan Jaka Jan. Hey, I'm back, and this time I'm consumed by the question that towers over all: Why? Admittedly, I'm not consumed by deeply philosophical issues. I do have over a day of holding down left mouse button while playing Legion. So this why is part of why wasn't my multi-threaded code faster than the singly threaded code? I felt like I was in that one clip of Lemmy's show. What's faster? Eight threads or one? That's right, one. But really, why? code for this video is in the GitHub repo linked in the description. The suspects, Godot tomfoolery, non posix threads, thread creation overhead, and the prime suspect, false sharing. That's right, this is a channel first, a true crime episode. I'm sure to rake in all of the female viewers now. All jokes aside, false sharing is when two threads are accessing memory addresses that share the same cache line. So even though they may be utilizing completely unique addresses, they can soft block each other while one core squats on a cache line and another waits to access it. And false sharing is bad because it turns something that should just take a few cycles into something that can take thousands of cycles. If you want to learn more about false sharing, I linked a couple good blog posts on it in the description. False sharing is my prime suspect because if we take a look at the arenas I'm using for multi-threading, that's right, it's just one slab of memory being split between all of the threads. So while the different threads work on unique segments, the ends do touch, and that's a no-go. Now, how does one detect false sharing? Good question. So as much as I am GDB pilled, it just didn't seem like something I could use it for. So I launched the scene with Rad Debugger. That's the debugger that Ryan Flurry is developing. See the link in the description. And yeah, I forgot that Godot gets rid of all debugging symbols. So this is all Greek to me, basically a no-go. Damn fine debugger though. I recommend it and its linker for anyone that's working with Unreal Engine. Plan B, just pop my beautiful code out of Godot and toss it into a huge for loop. Easy enough. And running them back to back, the issue persists. So that rules out Godot. And since I popped it out of Godot, I might as well use perf C2C to get an autistically detailed breakdown. Do I know what all of these stats mean? Not really. But what's relevant for false sharing is the hit M, short for hit modified stats. This is when one core loads a cache line that has been modified by another, making it have to dump its current cache to reload that modified cache line, which takes up those thousands of cycles I mentioned earlier. Now, I'm clearly not Google, I don't have a giant data setter, I only have one CPU, so all of my remote stats are gonna be zero and I can ignore them. But before that, peep the load local stat, 100%. Zero fucking load, Mrs. Baby. So if we look at the numbers, do some back of the napkin math, 1600 or so modified load hits out of 42,000 total loads. I'll say 2% and some change. Again, seems small, but as I said, a hit modified can make something that takes a few cycles take thousands instead. So let's take a gander at the chat. I cut out a section of me gaslighting myself about the percentages. It doesn't really matter. Looking at the cycle count I waste hundreds on each false share, and there are too many of them. So false sharing? Still the prime suspect. But how can I definitively prove it? Easy, just give each thread its own memory allocation. So I rewrote the tick function and set up a quick and dirty scratch allocator for each of my threads. Nothing fancy, but it gets the job done for testing. Gave it a spin and slightly slower. Not what I was expecting, honestly. Turns out false sharing was a red herring. This is turning into quite the episode of SVU, and I'm down to two suspects that I really didn't expect, non POSIX threads or thread creation overhead. So I rewrote the tick function again, this time using POSIX threads. While I was researching the last video, most comments I read seemed to suggest that POSIX threads are quote unquote better. They do allow modifying thread scheduling parameters, meaning I can crank up their priority to the max. So you know I did just that. Gave it another whirl and still slower than the singly threaded setup, but marginally faster than the other multi-threaded setups. The takeaway, never trust Reddit. And that left the last suspect, thread overhead. 
by the process of elimination, it had to be the cause. But how could I test that out? Well, if you really think about it, 65,000 is still a pretty small number. So if there's a flat overhead that threads incur each time they're created, then one would suspect that just increasing the amount of stuff to process would make the multi-threaded setup perform relatively better. So I increased the number up to 1 million and some change. And would you look at that, multi-threading is finally faster. So case closed, book em, Dano. But I ended up rewriting the tick function again, this time really cutting down on thread creation. And I don't know why, but this one is weird. As you can tell by the function naming, I was starting to just get a little tired, we'll say. But you gotta admit, that is a kinda thick looking function. Although this tick setup is cursed because it ends up with less active entities than its peers. Probably a bug. And just a reminder, I do read all your comments and I saw yours, Le Chaos X. You're right, all that mem copying to separate buffers does take up time. As I said in my comment, my hope was the multi-threading would offset that, but as we saw from the last video and the meat of this video, the trade-off was not worth it. So I rewrote the tick function again, this time just singly threaded, but no mem copying except to transfer component data while freeing entities. So just two loops and branch prediction abuse. And damn, this bad boy's fast. Great intuition, Le Chaos X, and I am happy to admit that I was wrong. So I rewrote the tick function again, multi-threaded, but with a similar setup to the better singly threaded tick. You can tell by my naming that I am off the goop at this point. And surprising no one, it's not faster than that hot singly threaded tick, but it is the best of all the multi-threaded ticks. So what did I learn from this quixotic endeavor? Aside from the actually practical stuff like how to use and interpret perf stats, I learned that thread overhead is real. I kind of threw it out as an offhand excuse last video, but <laughs> wow, uh, yeah, thread overhead, totally real. And looking at these numbers, I can understand why games structure big processes, physics, sounds, AI stuff, etc., to run in separate threads as servers instead of just multi-threading everything all the time. Seems with threads, it's best to be conservative. Just create a handful of threads once and let them run forever, instead of creating and joining dozens of threads multiple times every frame. And another important lesson, but I sort of already knew it, is just test, test, test and test again, because as I said at the start, I thought false sharing was the cause and I was completely wrong. And a shout out to the GAN man, he suggested making this video and helped me brainstorm some investigation routes. As I said previously, if you see the Tuxedo Pepe, you know you're getting quality. Also, errata for the previous video, this is a pretty huge correction actually, I'll probably pin a comment once I'm done with this video. I did an off by one oopsie, 65536 is 2 raised to the 16th, but it is not a magic number that causes perfect cache alignment that just makes things go super fast. As I said, I was using unsigned integers and there was a modular unsigned arithmetic bug. So it's a bug, but it's actually also defined behavior because it's supposed to be modular. And so the answer is I stopped using the low fat unsigned 16 bit ints and I started using the signed 32 bit ints. Basically a condition was always true or something, or never true, I forget what, and that was the cause of the speed up. Nice speed up, massive bug however. Fun fact, signed integer arithmetic is actually undefined behavior, which allows compilers to optimize it for speed. In this house, we appreciate undefined behavior. Oh, but what if you have to add a positive value to two raised to the 31st minus one? Listen up, when that day comes, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna use the full fat signed 64 bit ints, the Wagyu of integers. Oh, and since this video isn't about C and C++ macros, like I said it would be, here's my hot take. Cheeseburger. Skill issue? Half of you know a dozen languages and can hello world with brain fuck? Just go onto the part of the GCC website that covers them and read. You really don't have any excuse. Oh, but it's different from C++. My brother in Christ, you know more programming languages than spoken languages. Just 
learn one more. Macros are practical. There are like three advanced things you can do with them. X macros, variadic functions, and making a lisp. But if you're making a lisp, just bruh, bruh, just use steel bank common lisp if you want a lisp. Learn macros, use grep if you gotta, and grow up. Oh God, and that's it for this video. I gotta calm down a bit. Whew. My apologies for skipping June's video, but I was busy with what? I embrace the fact that to write a language server, I have to write a compiler first. So I've been locking in. I made my tokenizer an order of magnitude faster. Also, another hot take, you get to this video. Abstract syntax trees are trash, but you'll have to wait for next video. So as always, thank you for watching. I appreciate your time and I hope you have a good day. If you like the video, please give it a like. And if you wanna follow along with my next video, which will include everyone's favorite, algorithm slander, please subscribe. As I said earlier, quite like the NSA, I read all of your comments. But when I roast you, please understand it's out of love. There's also a Discord server where I encourage you to post memes in general and join me in algorithmic slander. Game dev is also a welcome discussion and I post pictures of things I bake when I bake them. And speaking of baking, let's get to it. Oh my God. I gotta heat it. I'm sorry for going off the goop. I'll try to, whew, deep breaths, deep breaths, long, slow breaths, square breathing. You guys do that square triangle breathing. It works great, actually. Yeah, it's great. I love it. Anyways, um, what do we have today? It's actually not bread. Cookies. Crazy. And let's take a look at these cookies. They look great. And you know me, my go-to cookie recipe, especially for chocolate chip cookies, Unless I'm doing something special and it's like by request, the Levon cookies, love them. They're, they're too much work though. These are, uh, this is Tara O'Brady's chocolate chip cookie recipe. For you diehard baking segment fans, you know I love this recipe. This is probably my favorite recipe of all time for baking because, again, it's so easy. It's, it's done in like 20 minutes, maybe even less. And, you, you know, you can bake it same day. It's great. And the cookies are delicious. Um, let's take a look at the next picture I have of them here. Yeah, look at that. Gorgeous cookies. I've got walnuts in them this time. You know, I love, I always toast my walnuts a bit. And I love them. And, you know, I like I like nuts in my cookies because I'm a, I'm a little nut, you know. <laughs> Unless you, if you couldn't tell by, by me going off, I am a little nut. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, Tara O'Brady's uh, chocolate chip cookie recipe. I'll be sure to add it in the description. Let me take a note of that in Emacs, baby. But, yeah, I love these cookies. They come out. They're, they're nice and crisp on the outside and I like a nice, I like a, I like a kind of not, not like goopy. I don't like a raw cookie. I do like a kind of fudgy cookie and these, these stay kind of, these stay fudgy. They stay fudgy on the inside. So they're really excellent. And you know, what's great about them is, uh, Tara includes this in a recipe. You can just toss whatever you want in there. So, you know, this time it's chalky chips and walnuts. Other times I've, uh, used, uh, like uh, a guava paste, great by the way, guava paste, I love guavas, dude. So guava paste, little, really it's soft candy and you know, I, I, so it's perfect. I'm of the idea that nothing like hard should be in a cookie. You don't wanna, you don't wanna put like a, like a mint in there, that's a no-go. If there's hard candy in your cookie, that's a no-go. It has to be like, you can have different consistencies but nothing that say like you know it's the, oh the bite and then you're like Kah! there should there should not be a Kah! in your cookie that's a that's a goof. But yeah, as you can see, I'm I'm quite opinionated about uh, cookies, similar to uh, macros. Many opinions. Stubborn like a mule, stubborn like a mule. You know that's what happens. Anyways, um. I'm gonna use the classic sign off, but with a guilty conscience because you know, cookies, there's no yeast there. I hate to say it, so I'm gonna be, I'll bring it up next time I'm, uh, you know, in that confessional with the priest. Uh, but, anyways, so, what is the classic sign? The yeast in the air is free, so go out there and bake. It's nutritious, it's delicious, it's good for you, and it makes a great gift to show people that you appreciate them. And I appreciate all of you. So, Thank you for watching, 
and I will see you next time. Our daddy taught us not to be ashamed of our UB. Especially since there's such good speed and all. Yeah, I see that. Your daddy gave you good advice.